Hey everybody, my name's Frank. I'm the electrical team manager at the Yacht Rigger. Today we want to talk about the ABYC standards as well as best practices, particularly for lithium batteries, inverters, solar, stuff like that. We have a lot of boats that come in that are not uh, compliant with ABYC standards and we do a lot of work to upgrade those. So I just want to show you some of the common things that we find that are not done right or not done the best way so that you can make an informed decision when you're going around getting quotes for electrical work on your boat. Now, one of the important things to know is that ABYC standards are not mandatory. They're voluntary, but they should be followed because they exist for a reason. They're the best practices that are out there for your safety on a boat. Unlike when you have a house, you don't necessarily have to have a licensed contractor. A lot of the marine electricians you might find they just call themselves marine electricians. They might not actually be certified by ABYC or by any other body. And it's important that you ask these kinds of things, these questions, so you make sure that the person working on your boat really knows what they're doing and that what you're paying for is going to actually be safe. So I'm gonna show you on this boat behind me a couple of things that we're doing this week. We often have boats come in that just get like a ABYC upgrade package where we just make it all safe. This boat's here for that this week. I'm gonna show you some stuff before, and then later this week, I'll show you after how we changed it. One common area that we see that boats don't meet the ABYC standards is navigation lights. If the lights are not LED, then it is likely that the wire going to the lights is undersized. And that's because for important items like navigation lights, we're only allowing a 3% voltage drop. And if the wire going to these lights is 14 gauge, like it commonly is on the mast, it's not gonna be big enough to keep that voltage drop to 3%. If you have LED lights, then you're probably fine because they draw so little that that voltage drop is low. So in general, the best way to comply with the standard is to upgrade all the lights to LED because then you don't have to upgrade the wiring, which is a lot of work, and the LED's better anyways because you have to go up the mast every six months to replace the anchor light bulb. It's not very fun. Okay, one of the most common areas uh, of non-compliance would be with lithium batteries. So lithium batteries, you gotta be very careful with them. They're so powerful. You see a lot of lithium batteries labeled as drop-in ready, like drop-in replacement. Like, no, it's just not the case. You can't just drop in lithium batteries in place of AGM batteries and be safe. You need to protect the wiring in the boat from the, the power that these batteries have. One of the most common areas that we see uh, non-compliance is a lack of fusing. The other is a uh, lack of a proper battery switch. So in this instance, we have both. So I'm going to show you the before and I'm going to show you what I see wrong here. And then later we're going to show you our preferred way. Okay, so we've got three rely on batteries in here. And one of the first things I notice is that there's not a single fuse in this entire locker. The main battery lead is right here and it goes off into the boat. There, there should at minimum be a fuse here, but really even that's not sufficient. What we're going to do to this is add a individual class T fuse for each battery. So each battery will have its own fuse. Then they'll go to a common bus bar. That bus bar will have a main class T fuse on it at 500 amps, or actually in this case, it might be more like 400. And then there'll be a battery switch. So here you see there's no battery switch. There's no way to disconnect these batteries from the rest of the system. And that's a big problem. So we're gonna add a battery switch in here. And that way we can disconnect the batteries from the rest of the system for servicing, for an emergency. One of the rules about the battery switch is it needs to be readily accessible. So if the battery switch is tucked away somewhere that you need hand tools to access, that's non-compliant. What we normally do is we use a remote battery switch that we can put uh, as close to the batteries as possible to reduce the wire runs. And then we have uh, just a little toggle switch that I'll show you that uh, you can turn off that battery switch from that remote location. And so that's really one of the best options. Another thing is spare fuses. So we always put a spare fuse next to uh, any fuse that we install. That way, if we're talking you through uh, troubleshooting on your boat and we say, oh, well, that fuse is blown, unsnap, unsnip the, the Class T fuse that's right next to it and put it in there. Not go to West Marine if there's even one near you and buy one. Um, we always like to include those spare fuses there. That's a good thing to ask about. You know, will there be spare fuses? What kind of fuses are you using? Because just the Class T fuses by themselves can be $50 to $80. Uh, for each one. So that certainly adds up in the cost, but it's something that you want to have. You want to have these spare fuses. Another thing I want to talk about is battery brands. We now only sell and install Victron batteries at this moment because we believe that they're the best batteries. There's some other brands that we've used before and they're not so bad, but a lot of these companies don't tend to stay in business. They get bought out, what have you. Um, 
Another one is like, for example, these rely on batteries. The, the internal BMS in these batteries is just really not that powerful. So the recommended continuous charge current for these batteries is 50 amps, which is just not very much. The Victrons can do more than double that. So this battery bank that has three batteries, I can only really safely put in 150 amps at a time, which is just really not that much if I load this thing up with solar and, and alternators. For the money, the Victron batteries are better buy because they're a very similar price point to the Reliance. Now you do with the Victron have to add an external BMS and that that's what kicks it over to make it more expensive option. But it's got much many more features that make them a better choice. So um, certainly you want to consider which brand battery you're getting. And for our money, we think the Victron ones are the best. It's a company that we know will be around to actually honor their, their warranty. And uh, the value for the money is great. Because the features are so rich. One other common non-compliant area is security of the batteries. So the batteries need to be secure so that they can't move at all. In this situation, these batteries, they're secure. So I'm not seeing any problems there. You can't move these batteries. In this instance, they've done that with this big metal bar. Um, I prefer not to have a big metal bar by the batteries, but you know, it's fine. This, this works. What you don't want to see is batteries that are loose. That's a problem. Um, so sometimes we'll have them strapped down. Sometimes like there'll be a little corner brace and then a strap or some kind of bar at the top. I mean, I prefer to use non-conductive material, but again, this this will do. Um, but that's a very important thing to make sure the batteries can't move. A few days later. Okay, so here we are at the battery bank. Just going to show you the few things we did here. We didn't even move the batteries at all. But what we did do is we added a class T fuse to each battery, like I discussed. Those are attached to the positive terminal with a copper bar that's covered in heat shrink insulation. There's a class T fuse inside. There's a spare fuse zip tied right next to it. Then uh, before the batteries were connected to one another like this, but now we've installed a Lynx power in, which is kind of like a sophisticated bus bar. And each battery is individually led to this. Oh my, that's so fancy. Well done, Frank. From here on the positive side, we go through a fuse, a, another class T fuse, and then to a remote battery switch. So that now there's actually a way to disconnect the uh, batteries from the rest of the system. There is also a shunt under this cover right here, and that's just measuring how much power is going in and out of the battery bank. There's just a little fuse block that's got some small fuses uh, to make sure that these RBSs can be powered even when this battery switch is turned off. On the topic of shore power, there's two main things that we're looking for. One is that the input is protected by an ELCI breaker. If it's a European boat or a foreign boat, yeah, it might be called a RCD, residual, residual current device, or an RCBO. But anyways, it's a breaker that is designed to detect if there's any current on uh, the ground wire, in which case it'll trip the breaker for that reason, not just for overcurrent. We're installing one on this boat. This boat came to us with just a single 30 amp shore power inlet, which is, is really kind of insufficient for this boat. So we're upgrading it to have a single 50 amp. Uh, in this case, we're using this uh, Blue Sea Systems ELCI. It comes like with a box. It's just pretty easy to install. Um, so we're going to add that. The other big shore power thing that is often missing, especially if it's a foreign boat, is a galvanic isolator. So a galvanic isolator blocks DC ground current uh, from the ground wire. And that can cause galvanic corrosion on the boats uh, to, to the anodes uh, or to the running gear. Install one of those if there's not one present. The only thing you really need to know there for the ones that are available to purchase is that it's properly sized. So this boat right now has a 30 amp galvanic isolator. That's fine for the current situation, but now that we're adding a 50 amp inlet, we need to get a larger galvanic isolator because we'll be over that limit. As far as which one to buy, all the ones available on the market are compliant with ABYC standards, so there's not really much need to go into that. Later that week. So the, when the boat first came to us, it just had a single 30 amp shore power cord, which is just not quite enough for this boat. So we've replaced it with a single 50 amp. Uh, a lot of boats this size might have two 30s, and that's fine as well. Um, the way the shore power works now is it comes in through a new inlet that we installed through this 50 amp shore power cord. It then comes to this ELCI breaker right here. This is an, an ABYC standard and it's such for a reason. It's monitoring for ground current and it'll trip if there is any. And so that's to protect you from a shock hazard on board the boat. But they won't interact with this breaker too often. They'll mostly interact with the shore power breaker at the electrical panel because from here it then goes to that breaker there. 
And that's how they're controlling what's going to the inverter versus what's going to power the loads on board the boat. Again, there was also a, a galvanic isolator already on the boat, but it was sized for a 30 amp cable. So we've replaced that with a larger one that's sized appropriately for this. Okay, when it comes to solar wiring, there's a couple of different ways of doing it. Our preferred method is to use as many solar controllers as possible. Of course, we love the Victron brand here. So those are NPPTs. We like to do one per panel, maybe one for every two panels. The more you have, the less impact you're getting from, from shading. I don't like a situation like on this boat where there's four panels and they're all on one charge controller. One of the most important reasons for the multiple charge controllers is to deal with shading. Um, with shading, uh, it can be really detrimental to all the panels that are connected together. So if you've got four panels connected together, like we do here, and you get some shade on one of them, it has a much worse impact on the entire array than if those were all separated to uh, separate controllers. So while the cost and space consumed does add up to have all those different controllers, it, you get much more power for, for what you're doing. We have uh, multiple runs of wires going inside. So we'd have four runs of wires. So you can start to see how the stuff starts to add up in cost. Um, and that's one thing that to factor in when you're considering this. The way we like to do it as well is that each uh, solar panel feed from the panel has a breaker that will trip both the uh, positive and the negative DC wires. Then we have... <laughs> The way we like to do it is we like to have a double pole breaker that will break both the positive and negative wires from the solar panel. From there, it goes into the solar charge controller. And on the output side, we just break the uh, positive wire and then we'll bring those together usually on a bus and then take that to the house system. Then those will all be networked together for communications purposes and sent to any onboard monitoring system like maybe a Victron Servo. Another thing I look for on a solar installation is the structure itself. Um, we like to beef it up a lot. Uh, we are mostly offshore sailors here. And so I don't like to see an arch that can get kind of resonant, like starts to vibrate. One thing to consider is the, the legs. So in this instance, these legs angle back. Uh, that's a much stronger scenario. It's, it's even stronger if it goes all the way to the back, which in this case, it only goes maybe two thirds of the way back. Uh, what, what we're trying to do is reduce how much overhang there is behind the uh, down leg, and that will strengthen it up. Um, the other thing to consider is what diameter is the tubing. So this is kind of a small diameter tubing. And if I start shaking on this, you can see the whole thing, the whole thing starts resonating and, and vibrating. I don't love it. I mean, it's probably fine, but you like it to be a little beefier. When you're slamming into waves, that thing's gonna be shaking around. It's the last thing I really wanna worry about. We've had plenty of our solar arches go through really big storms, including uh, a, I think it was five panels, maybe six panels. It was on a catamaran uh, in Fort Myers Beach in Hurricane Ian. Thing didn't even budge okay so it's really important to have a uh, peace of mind that the structure itself is sound uh, let's compare for comparison this is a arch that we built this is actually a slightly smaller boat but instead of four panels we've got five panels so the arch is a little bit bigger one of the things that we do is we use uh, a bit larger diameter stainless steel tubing and then we also use uh, stiffener bars between the panels and that really helps keep it rigid so if i start whaling on this thing I really just can't get it going. It's really hard to make it start vibrating. So this is a lot stiffer uh, of an arch. And I really like that for when you're slamming offshore, you don't have to worry about this thing bouncing around back there. Boom. Okay, there's a couple of points about inverters that we see that are often non-compliant. Let's go through an order. The first would be the DC fuse. So in that case, it's right here. This is good. We've got, we've got a class T fuse. Um, Technically, if we're going to be sticklers about it, we should have a cover on this uh, because this compartment can be accessed without hand tools. There's just a little finger latch right here. So we'll probably put a cover on this. And again, we'll put a, a spare fuse right here. So if it ever blows, it's there. The other thing that should be added is a, uh, a battery switch. And we'll just add that right here by this fuse. The reason for that is that if you have to get up there into this inverter and uh, you can't turn off the supply without taking out the fuse, then you're going to have a, a hot wire there if you ever have to take that wire off. So we always like to have a battery switch there. Another thing that we can use with the battery switch, in this instance, we don't have Victron batteries or a Victron BMS. Inside of the inverter is a large capacitor. Think of it as a large, uh, think of it as a small battery. A large capacitor is like a small battery. When we first connect the batteries, there's going to be a large inrush current into the inverter to fill that capacitor. And then all of a sudden it's full and it stops. And that can damage the inverter. 
So what we do as a best practice, not as a requirement, is add an inverter precharge circuit. And I'll show you that once we install it. But what it will do is we'll have the battery switch off, and then we'll slowly feed a little bit of power from one side of the battery switch to the other so that we charge that capacitor. Once it's charged, then we close the battery switch, and now we've safely precharged the inverter. If you're using Victron batteries with a Victron BMS, it automatically has a precharge cycle during the startup phase of the BMS. So we don't need that. It automatically goes through that process. Another reason why Victron is such a great system uh, for their batteries. Another item we commonly see missing is a case ground. So a case ground is a, a negative colored wire, so black or yellow, that's connected to the actual case of the inverter. Um, there's a bolt usually near the bottom that it goes to, and then that goes to the negative bus bar on the boat. That's there so if there's a, a, an AC short to the case, that it can safely travel through that uh, case ground and not through you to find ground. So um, that's an important one. This boat doesn't have it. We're going to add that. Just simple wire, not that hard to do. It's also important to make sure that there's breakers for the AC input and the AC output uh, on the inverter. Um, it's not too common for this to be non-compliant, and in this case it is compliant, but uh, just to make sure that there are breakers in place. Uh, there are some technicalities about if the wire is big enough, then the inverter is technically self-limiting and there doesn't have to be a breaker. But yeah, it's always a good idea to have um, to trip uh, if there's uh, overcurrent or to be able to turn off for servicing. We always like to have breakers to be able to shut off, uh, compartmentalize the system so that we can replace equipment and work on it safely. Um, otherwise, we have to shut down everything, which is not that fun. Another important item is wire support. So uh, the wire needs to be supported every 18 inches, and that's important so that wires aren't swinging around and chafing on stuff. Um, I haven't seen any issues uh, so far on this boat with that. Uh, right here, I've, I've actually cut these zip ties because I was, I was just trying to determine what all these wires were. So like, for example, if this was not zip tied and it was loose like this over a run more than 18 inches, that could be a problem because this could come down here, rub on this hose clamp, chafe through. Now all of a sudden you're not getting power to something you thought. So that's one important thing is make sure there's not loose wires everywhere. 18 inches is the rule. There's a couple exceptions, especially when connecting to a battery, but in general, 18 inches needs to be supported. Wires shouldn't be loose. Make sure they're not chafing on anything. A few days later. And this area is where the inverter is. It's, it's up above right here. And what we did was we added a class T fuse uh, for the inverter. So it has its own fusing. And there's a spare fuse right here. And there's also an RBS up here. Now, this RBS is a little different. Uh, this one is designed so that if it loses power on the terminals, it'll intentionally open itself so that when power comes back, it doesn't uh, close automatically. The reason for that is because there's a capacitor inside the inverter and we want to pre-charge that. So if we look down over here, there's a pre-charge circuit that we've added. This can be used to safely pre-charge the inverter to bring it online in a safe fashion. This simply gets held down while it slowly allows some power to go into the inverter to pre-charge it. Once it is pre-charged, then the RBS can be closed and now it's connected to the battery system. Also in here, we've added a small charger down in this corner. And this charger is to maintain the start batteries because there wasn't a way to maintain the start batteries before. Uh, and now that we've made sure the lithium battery bank is disconnected from the start battery bank, we need a way to keep those topped up. So this is just a Victron product that is very reasonably priced. It's powered via AC power. And basically when they're at the dock for quite a long time and not gonna be running the engines, they just keep that turned on. It just keeps those start batteries charged, ready to go. On the electrical panel, one of the common issues we see is that the indicator lights don't work properly after somebody's upgraded the inverter. Uh, the reason for this is that there's a neutral wire that is is for the uh, for the for the lights, and somebody's reworked the neutrals down below to make sure that the power's going to the right place. But they haven't reworked the indicator uh, the indicator light neutrals. And so, if you uh, are turning on breakers and seeing that other breakers indicator lights are coming on that aren't on, or the lights aren't coming on, that's an indicator that there's an issue with uh, the way those are wired. It's not um, terribly complicated to fix, but you do need to know what you're doing. So that's one thing to look for when you're picking up your boat. Check each breaker, make sure that the indicator lights are working properly. 
at the electrical panel, uh, as you recall, we had a color control GX that was right here. We've replaced that. We've put our RBS switches right here. So the house battery bank and the inverter can both be turned off from here in an emergency or for servicing. And we've installed a Touch 70. Um, Touch 70 is a lot nicer to look at, but in addition to that, we've also programmed solar priority so that it will prioritize solar power to power the DC loads. It's a really nice feature that we really enjoy. The other thing we did over here is we uh, adjusted the way shore power was coming in. That was part of the upgrade to the 50 amp shore power. So from a visual perspective, not much has changed. Basically a lockout slider was removed and some of these breakers were upgraded to a larger size. But this is enabling the boat to have significantly more power available to it when at shore. Okay, this is a class T fuse holder. They come in different sizes based on how big the class T fuse is. This one's for 110 amps to 200 amps uh, because this, these batteries are gonna have 200 amp fuses. The rule for overcurrent protection, which means fuses or breakers, is that it has to be within seven inches of the uh, source of power. Uh, there's some exceptions. For example, if it's connected to a battery, then it can be up to 70 inches. However, if it's longer than seven inches, uh, it's gotta be in a sheath. And a sheath, uh, most commonly for batteries, is gonna be a uh, split limb, like the kind of corrugated black plastic looking stuff. Uh, that's the best way to do that if the wires are going to be longer than seven inches. And so a lot of times we see installs where, yes, there are fuses, that's great, but the wires themselves don't have a sheath over them. The reason that's important is because between the batteries and the fuse, that's one of the most dangerous, pla most dangerous places on the boat. Because if that wire chafes through, you could end up with a short circuit that's unprotected that could lead to a uh, uh, fire. So minimizing how long the battery whips, that's what we call the wires from the battery to the fuse. Minimizing how long those are is really important and wrapping them in split limb is really important. I'm sure that Ryan can flash a picture of one of our installs showing what the split limb looks like. The other solution we commonly do is to take a copper bar, which is great, and we'll bolt this to the positive stud, and then we'll bolt this to the class T fuse holder. This has uh, insulation over it, We'll put a, a cap over here so it's insulated, and then this goes over there so that it's all protected and you can't uh, accidentally short circuit right here. So this is our favorite solution when space allows because you've really shortened that distance that you could have a problem before you hit that first fuse. Another common thing when you do a lithium upgrade that you need to be aware of is that most alternators are not gonna be able to safely charge that lithium bank. So we need a, a, a regulator in between the alternator and the lithium bank. We need that for a few reasons. One is because the lithium batteries, they have such low resistance and they're just so power hungry, they're gonna pull as much power as they possibly can from that alternator. Well, they might end up pulling too much and frying the alternator. What we commonly do is have an external regulator and that will control the alternator in the way that we want, put out the voltage that we want, the amperage that we want to do so in a, in a safe manner. We commonly use the Zeus alternator regulator. There's also some other brands out there that can be used, and it's just important that you have something. In lieu of that, the cheaper solution is to use uh, like a DC to DC converter. So commonly we'll use a Victron Orion, or now they have the Victron Orion XS, which does uh, 12 volts to 12 volts at 50 amps. That's what we're going to put on this boat. So we'll be able to take 50 amps from each engine and send it to the lithium bank to make sure that we don't work this alternator too hard. That's an important thing to do. On a lot of boats, you'll see we install high output alternators that are specifically designed to get as much power as possible into the, into the house bank. But in a situation where you don't wanna spend uh, up to 10 grand per engine to get that, the DC to DC chargers like the Victron Orion is a much cheaper way to get some power from your engines. <laughs> Lounging. Mating. Hey. Is this okay? <laughs> yeah, it works. Okay, you're rolling? Yeah, rolling. What we've done is we've put in the new Victron Orion XS, which is a 12 volt to 12 volt 50 amp charger. And in this way, we're feeding the start battery to it and the output, we're regulating the voltage and the amperage and sending that to the lithium bank. So that way we can really control uh, what's happening and it's networked to the servo and the servo has been told how much power it's allowed to put into the battery bank at one time from any given source. And because it's controlling both of the Orions as well as the solar charge controllers and the inverter, it can globally limit the amount of power and the voltage that we're putting into the bank to make sure that everything is going how it should be and we don't go 
too hard for those batteries. So that's been a, a really nice addition in there. They're programmed so that, of course, they don't start charging until the engine is turned on and the alternator is charging. And then there's a little bit of a delayed startup there. So that's how those work. It's a really affordable way to add alternator charging to a lithium bank. Uh, another item to look for is uh, there's an ABYC standard that says that there shouldn't be more than four lugs on any one terminal stud. Um, we see this a lot, especially on batteries. People would just like, let me add another wire on the battery rather than put in a bus bar. So uh, on this engine here, there was five wires on the positive stud. Um, so fortunately, one of those wires doesn't do anything. It's not actually going to anywhere. So in this case, we just removed that wire. But in a situation where you had more of those, what you do is you take a bigger gauge wire up to a bus bar and then move all of those numerous other wires to that bus bar um, so that they could be spread out. Uh, we try to generally only have like two wires per stud. You get more and what happens is the, the bolt, it will back out much easier. It just doesn't have as good of a grip. And uh, loose wires is very dangerous on a boat. It's important that we don't combine different chemistries of batteries. So if we're putting in lithium house batteries, it's likely that there's already a way to combine the AGM start batteries to the house batteries. We need to make sure that that's either really hard to do or it's not gonna happen automatically. A lot of boats will have a system where if the alternators are charging the start batteries, it'll automatically combine it with the lithium batteries. We don't want that. What that means is that there needs to be some kind of regulation about when those uh, batteries can be combined. In an emergency situation, you need to start the engine and the AGMs are dead, sure. Let's make that happen, but let's make sure it can't stay connected for too long. Another thing is that if we're installing high output alternators and they're going to go charge the lithium bank, well, we've just removed the way that we're going to charge the AGM start bank. So now those start batteries are going to go dead. So we have to provide a different means to keep the AGM start batteries charged. Again, that will usually be a Victron Orion that's going to do, uh, it's a DC to DC charger. That way we can tell the Orion, take power from the lithium bank and I want you to charge this AGM battery at this profile. So it's really important to make sure that those chemistries are separated and that every charger that's connected to the different chemistries is charging at the, at the right profile for that chemistry. So it is actually an ABYC standard that you make a wiring diagram for the work that you've done. Um, in our case, we produce these ones digitally. And when the boat leaves, we give them a print copy and then we email them a PDF. Uh, it doesn't have to be the sophisticated, it could be hand-drawn. Just needs to be such that somebody can go on the boat and figure out how the boat's wired. The other thing that helps with this is on the boat to actually put wire labels. Sure, even if they're just pieces of blue tape with Sharpie writing, that's better than nothing. A lot of times we find that there's nothing. And so you end up paying an electrician hours to figure out what's done before they can make any further upgrade. So it's really important that you're looking for, am I gonna get a wiring diagram? Are wires gonna be labeled? Another thing that we do for our clients is we produce for, for large lithium and inverter installs is we produce a manual. And so this is an, in addition to their boat owner's manual, but this goes through all of the equipment we installed and explains uh, how it works, like where it's installed. So there's photos of this client's individual install and explains things like, critical numbers as far as what to keep loads to. It talks about what to do if the if you run your batteries too low and the BMS shuts off, how do you recover from that? Um, goes through a lot of things that helps the owner to understand how their system works, but it's really good for if, you know, when you go to sell your boat, that you have all that so the next person uh, knows how to do it. When we finish the project, we do a walkthrough with the client. So I have both of these items in hand and I show them how everything works and show them where everything is installed. And uh, this can usually take anywhere from two hours to an entire day, depending on the scale of the project. And uh, it's really important that the client understands what they've paid for and what, how the system works. These Victron systems that we install these days, they all have remote monitoring. So we connect the servo to the internet. And since most of the boats these days have uh, Starlink, they're always connected to the internet. So from my desk, I can log into almost all the systems that we've installed and I can monitor if there's an issue. So if a client calls and says, hey, I don't know that this thing is charging quite right or whatever, I can log in and I can see all the data and see if there's an issue. I can even push changes if I need to. So that's really helpful. Um, there's been several situations. It's usually when a client runs their battery down to like 15% and it shuts off because they're running the AC 
little too long. And uh, I can help them like walk through that and get it back online. Usually within the first two weeks after boat leaves, we do actively monitor the boat on uh, the remote monitoring. Um, just to make sure everything's working right. After that, we kind of just uh, wait till we hear if there's a problem. But one client, right after they left, I, I noticed one evening before I went to bed that they had uh, their aircon on, pretty full blast, and they hadn't charged up enough before they went to bed that night. And I was thinking, hmm, yeah, their battery's gonna die for tonight for sure. And so I, I texted them and I said, hey, uh, if you're reading this, you've probably just woken up and realized that your batteries have shut off. Just a reminder, here's what to do to get it back online. So he wakes up at, you know, 5, 6 a.m. The batteries are shut off at 3, and he goes through the steps, brings it back online. And then once he gets it online, he's got Starlink again. He's messaging me like, oh, thanks for helping me get that back online. So sometimes we do, even though if you have a problem before, you do. Uh, it's, been, it's a really helpful thing, and it's one of the really nice things about having Starlink or some other way to, like, always be connected to the Internet is that help is just right there, and we can really see so much data when all the system is, is uh, Victron products.